The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome, Full Stature Ministries, Kingdom Life Church. And today is a day I'm bragging on the men in this church. However, the ladies are just as competent, but you know what? We've got some of the best men around, Christian wise. And so when I was praying about this this morning, thinking, we've got sons and daughters that have basically walked in, in such a, a wonderful revelation uh, having done the 60-day challenge, having a welcome transformation and welcome change lives. Um, I wanted to challenge these men. I guess this would be like, what, extra credit? <laughs> I don't know. Seriously, the men in this church are mature, stable, steadfast, immovable, unbelievable. Oh, did I say unbelievable? Okay. But uh, today... Uh, the title of the message is, and this is for uh, daughters as well, but I really wanted to challenge the sons. How to optimize the 60-day challenge. How to optimize the 60-day challenge. This applies to everybody. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and there's seven areas that when I observe people going through the 60-day challenge, just uh, the, the strengths they've had, the difficulties they've had in the process. I found areas that if they were optimized, anyone doing the 60-day challenge, if you would do it over again, you know, it's supposed to be a lifestyle anyway. It's not for 60 days and then you quit. <laughs> That'd be like saying, I got saved, I'm done. I read the Bible once, I'm done. You know, this is how to optimize the 60-day challenge. And I really feel like the Lord dropped into my spirit. Based on people on the online school, we've got like 3,000 people on the online school, and you see the questions they have on the 60-day challenge. I've heard the questions we've had in the church. Uh, but I want to start with those uh, seven areas, seven areas that if we would fine-tune these areas, we would see even better transformation quicker. Is there anybody who would not like better transformation quicker? I think that's a good, good thing. So starting with area <clears throat> number one is location. Uh, location. After you learn and understand the basic location, because that, that is a major fallacy in the church, people really didn't know the answer. And on Thursday nights, we even had some people come forward from other churches, and we had them go through it, and sure enough, they were 100% wrong. I said, where's your thoughts? That one they got right. Well, yeah, we've got to give them credit where credit is due. They got a 30. Where's, where's your will? Where's your emotions? Okay, therein lies a significant problem with being a Christian. Are you a Christian in name only, or are you Christian in function? There's a big difference. We were called to be Sabbath sons and daughters. We were predestined by God to walk as sons and daughters unto the Lord. Now, if you know that your thoughts are here and that the seat of the emotions is in the gut, another thing you need to know is your conscience is not up here. Your conscience is in the gut. Your conscience is the voice of your spirit. This is the epicenter of your spirit. So the seat of the emotions, the voice of your spirit. Now here's to tweak this. Say, say you know all the parts. Okay, I know this is my Bible heart. I know that this is the seat of the emotions. I know that uh, my flesh is mind, will, and emotions. My heart is spirit and soul together. I know these things, but here's the key, key to location. It's one thing to know the location. It's one thing to say I can drop down. It's another thing that if you really wanted to see rapid progress in your Christian walk, you develop what I call dual awareness. So area number one, you want to really tweak it, you walk in dual awareness, and that means that you don't throw your brains out, but it's like, you know, you really, you really can talk and walk at the same time. 
Has anybody ever tried it? Of course you can do that. So you can do two things at the same time. You can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? Then you can, as a believer who's received Jesus into your heart, you can be aware of your gut while you're thinking at the same time. This is not rocket science. This is simple Christianity 101. But if you really wanted to tweak, if you really wanted to draw closer to God, the first thing you'd have to do is that in locating the parts, you've got to learn to function in those parts. Knowing them in your head is not going to do any good. Dual awareness. If you would just strategize that t today, tomorrow, I'm going to, in my prayer time, Endeavor to be aware of what's going on in my gut and my head at the same time. You, you, would, you would make rapid volumes because most of the time you can start out in prayer, drop down to your spirit, touch God, and then the next thing you know you're thinking about what you got to do for the day and, you're, and you are literally drawn away. I'm saying think about what you've got to do. You've got to go to work. You've got to do your job, right, which requires thinking. But it also says you are a spiritual being. You are supposed to be in the world but not of the world. So how do I go in the world and not be of the world? It's that dual awareness. So out of the seven areas, dual awareness needs to be practiced, but you would see rapid progress rapid progress. Uh, when I discipled Jennifer, it was getting her out of her head. But then once she located the gut and the belly, and when I said, there, you feel that peace? That's God himself, not an it. He himself, scripture says, is our peace. Personhood over it. Dual awareness requires you to acknowledge God. Uh, the, the, in training people in this, we've always used uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That's exactly what I'm saying, only w walking it out on a day-to-day -day basis in area one. So it's like if we would do the imagery of trust in the Lord, it would be trust would be a surrender, like you sing in all the songs that a large portion of people don't know how to do, <laughs> but they can sing about it. All right. Surrender is a yielding of your will to the Jesus in you. Trust. It's the opposite of try. As a matter of fact, somebody sent me a picture of a street sign in Charlotte called Tristing. And they said it's kind of like the battle between trying and trusting. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, okay, I don't want to, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> But you know what? There's a truth to that. There's a battle between trying and trusting, and we want to get to that. But if you could tweak on your day-to-day -day thing, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't just quote the scripture, trust in the Lord with all my heart, and then don't do it, all right? I'm telling you, try doing it. How would you do it? Trust in the Lord is paying attention or focusing down here without throwing your brains out. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. What's that mean? I'm going to engage my mind and my spirit at the same time. I'm going to walk and chew gum. With all of your heart, mind, will, emotions, mindset, all three need to be in harmony. It's like uh, 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 the workings of a, inner workings of something mechanical. You know what? Everything has to work together. It's not you pick and choose what part you want to pay attention to. And people do do that. Hmm? We're saying trust in the Lord with all of my heart, spirit, mind, will, and emotions, all of them in sync. Now, how would I know if they're in sync? Peace, for one. Peace is an indicator that your clock is ticking on the inside properly in harmony. However, look at this scripture again. Trust in the Lord, yield, surrender, with all of your heart. Lean not on this. There's a built-in warning, isn't there? Don't get sidetracked with this. Don't go off thinking because that thing will go in loops and circles and really you accomplish nothing because nobody is smarter than God. Nobody. And in this day of trials and tribulations, I want to see my church rise up and have the Holy Spirit teach them how to navigate when things are catastrophic, 
when things are not going well in your life, when things are amiss. Learning how to, uh, you know, when it says trust the Lord with all of your heart, lean not on this, that's the warning, acknowledge. And I loved it as a baby Christian, the first time I looked up that word acknowledge. I thought acknowledge means acknowledge him, you know, I think about him and all, no. Acknowledge means through divine intimate touching. Through divine intimate touching. 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 Spiritual feelings. If you don't get acquainted with spiritual feelings, you, you, you're just an accident going somewhere to happen. That's right. Because there's physical feelings, physiological feelings, there's emotional feelings, and there's spiritual feelings. And quite frankly, you've got to know those spiritual feelings. You really need intimacy with God. Without that, you are an accident going somewhere to happen. With all your Bible knowledge, you're still an accident going somewhere to happen if you can't touch Him and acknowledge Him through divine, intimate connection in your heart. That would require dual awareness. Lean not on this, but you don't throw it out. I'm not leaning on this, I'm leaning on Him. He understands more than I'll ever understand. Trust in Him is smarter, and going with the peace of God is smarter than all of the reasoning information put together. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on this. There's a built-in warning there. Don't, be, don't, don't go off on a tangent. Acknowledge Him in here. How do I acknowledge Him here? How do I know if He's here? Peace. Acknowledge Him through divine, intimate connection. And he will, look where I'm pointing, he will direct your path. God was showing me all of the scriptures about tribulation and consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials and the testing of your faith produces. And it's not pleasant, discipline's not pleasant, but we're, we're pressed down, perplexed, but what? Never crush. All things are working together for the good to them that love God. Let's live in that realm instead of just say, oh, I just skipped those scriptures. The reason you skip those scriptures is you haven't learned to navigate that the devil's throwing everything he can on the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's going to throw everything he can at you, what the Holy Spirit wants to do in every situation. He wants to guide your path. That's what it means to, to uh, all things are working together for the good. The devil's not working together for your good. It's that through divine intimate connection, God wants to direct your path in the midst of being pressured. I, I love the, 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 uh, the one uh, footnote that I read years ago where it said, you know, we're being pressed on this but not crushed. We're, this is coming against us and that's coming against us and this is coming against us. And it says, but nothing can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing, neither life nor death, nor things present, nor things future. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. And it's like the love of God is pressing me on all sides, eliminating any other option. I don't have any other options, but the love of God is pressing me on all sides. But the only way that can happen is if all things are working together for the good to them that love God is that in the midst of all of the pressures, trials, and tribulation, and in this world you will have tribulation. And the message translation says, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer for not just that I've overcome the world, but I've removed its ability to harm you. So, and all this stuff that's coming against you, God's removed its ability to harm you, but it's going to require you being aware of how he's directing your path in the midst of the trials and the tribulation. Not skipping all trials and tribulations. In this world, you will have them. And think in the natural, you'd have to be a nut to quote scriptures like, consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. That the testing of your faith. What rational person would want to do that? A spiritual person would say, there's another realm of living. I live from my gut. I live from my, my head and my heart. And they're in alignment with submission to the Lordship of Jesus. Let the peace of God rule means Jesus is ruling in my life. It's not Jesus is my Savior. I said a sinner's prayer. And then I pretty much do whatever I want to do. No. Area number one for challenge and this is for people who have taken a 60-day challenge who have in turn made it a lifestyle. 
This is time to get your attention because the pressures in this world are not easing up. The enemy's not backing off of his attacks, is he? Huh? In the world. Is it getting more and more pleasant? No. Then you should be getting more and more aware of the solution that we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. How do you become more than conquerors? We're going to have to find out to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not on this. I'll get you in trouble. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. And we're going to get more and more into the other things that you need to quicken. But dual awareness is area number one that you better start doing it. You're going to have to start, not drop down and deal with your stuff. You know what that implies? That implies you don't know how to stay down. Ah, in other words, be, be frenzied all day long and then have a problem go, oh, Jesus, I got to drop down. Now. How about abiding? How about John 15? How about challenge to walk in the spirit and not according to the flesh? If you have to keep dropping down all the time, something happens. It tells me you weren't there in the first place. Uh-oh. We're, we're going to have a... Um, <laughs> We're going to have a membership drive, right? <laughs> um, to, to make ready of people prepared for what's coming, I want you to get so proficient. And we've got some of the finest men and women in this church who have paid the price, who have learned these things. And I'm saying it's time to tweak it and, 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 and optimize what you've learned. This is time to go over the top. This is the time to fortify, strengthen, and establish all of those good things that he put in you. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. All right? So location, location, location. It's our spiritual real estate, and by golly, it, if it's important in real estate, you better believe it's important in the kingdom. Location, location. Now, if you know where the parts are, that's not the end of the challenge. To make this a, uh, a more of an optimizing your 60-day challenge, you've got to practice. You walk in this building, out of this building, go to work, go home. Start paying attention. It's that much focus. You give power to what you give attention to. If you start doing this and saying, and it'll be intermittent. I can remember as a baby Christian, God showing me how forgiveness came from the heart. And I got all excited. But then I found out that it needed practice because Practice will make it permanent. And at first, I thought it was impossible. Oh, forgive? Oh, man, I, I get upset with everything. I, I, I can't go to work. I can't concentrate. I've got to forgive constantly. It's a, I was like, man, this would take all day long. I better not be around people because <laughs> the minute I'm around people, i got to forgive somebody. Oh, no. And what did God do? He just kept saying, mm-hmm, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And he kept drawing me and drawing me. And, I'm, and I was kind of like Peter. Well, where else would I go? <laughs> I don't have another plan. A little reality therapy. Okay, Dennis. What, are you, what you are currently doing, is it working? Yeah, but it's really hard. Okay, you have a, a better idea? No. Where would I go but other than Jesus? Oh, okay. And here's the beauty of it. When you remain steadfast in him to the last thing he told you to do, like forgive, the periods of hassles got farther and farther apart. And I felt that I was walking in the fruit of the forgiveness or in the love of God. And I got stronger somehow in the inner man, in the inner person got stronger, and I didn't have to do it constantly. I was getting a little bit proficient at it. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to have a, a, a lifestyle. As a matter of fact, you are supposed to, as a believer, preach the forgiveness of sin. John 20, Luke 24, go preach the remission of sin. Jesus preached forgiveness. You should be preaching it too, but why preach it if you can't live there? Hmm? Now, in that understanding for the dual awareness, you're going to, what you're going to cultivate is you're going to cultivate a, a sensitivity to your conscience, which is the voice of your spirit. 
So your mind is going on all different topics. Remember, we said it's like a car. The mind is like a steering wheel. Uh, Jason pointed out it's like those ones in the, in the grocery store where the kids can sit and they can do this and they're, they're not really affecting the direction. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what your mind does. It doesn't really uh, affect a lot of direction until there's a motor and until there's a gear shift that engages. So this thing here is your mind. The motor has to be on. That's the emotion. Emocognition, emovolition. The emotions control your thinking and your choices. And then when the emotions go, oh, we're going to go for it. There's no cars on the road. I'm, Pow! put that in gear and take off. Whoa, that's fun. Mind, will, and emotion. But if you don't start paying attention to what's going on down here, your conscience or the voice of your spirit will kind of go, eh. But you know what? If you override conviction, eh, eventually you won't even hear it. It's like putting a pillow over the telephone until you don't hear it. It's still ringing. You're just not aware of it. When I married Jennifer, I saw how abused she had been in her uh, previous life. I said, God, if I ever hurt her feelings, I want you to just kick my conscience in the gut. I want kicked in the gut. And you know, the first time I hurt her feelings, I just about doubled over. Careful what you ask for. But I think your conscience... Your conscience should learn to shout because some of you, you got pillows on it. You really want to tweak area one? Then let's say, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I remove any deadness, any, which is usually covered with an excuse. I cover any excuses, any, any vows, anything. I, I want my conscience to shout. Remove any barnacles. I ask for cleansing right now in the name of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, cleanse my conscience to be more sensitive than ever before. Okay? Amen. Area, that's area one. We could go on forever, but we're not. I've got to go to these other areas. Right? You got dual awareness is the homework, right? That means, hi, Jennifer. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Dawn. Hi, Garrett. While I'm saying and using my mind, greeting, saying, discussing, I'm paying attention to how this is reacting because God wants to guide and direct it through his divine empowerment, divine enablement, divine acknowledgement. Acknowledge him in all your ways. So while I'm talking to people, if this doesn't feel comfortable, Who's talking? God. Now you have a chance to respond. How can I respond redemptively while I'm in a conversation, but this down here is starting to bother me? Pay attention to that. <laughs> he knows more than you do. <laughs> Increase the sensitivity to my conscience, the voice of my human spirit. Let it be yes and amen for me. Okay. The second one is in understanding area two is in understanding dropping down to your spirit. That he was there at the door and knock. Okay. The key to understanding drop down is knowing that when you go down, you want God. To not do, we, we saw here on Thursday nights, we saw people not make the same mistakes. Who's the first person or situation? My mother. What's the feeling? I love my mother. Now, what do you suppose would be wrong with that? Shouldn't you love your mother? Huh? God is not doing what the scripture said in Psalm 32 5. I acknowledge, I dropped down in my prayer time, I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. God's not looking for your virtues so that you could talk about how great you are. He's looking for what's amiss and out of alignment. I acknowledge my sin and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. Continually unfolding the past till all is told. Oh, 
Oh. And then you instantly forgave me the guilt and iniquity of my sin. That's Psalm 32, 5 in the Amplified. Everybody should have that on their refrigerator. Everybody. Even me. Jennifer, put that on our refrigerator. Who's doing the searching there? He's acknowledging his sin, but it's God that's searching the heart. And he's saying, I'm giving it to you. And I'm going to continue to unfold it all until I'm clean. Then the next one would be Psalm 19, similar. And you've heard this again and again. But if we're going to tweak this area about dropping down, you've got to know more and more we're going to function from the Spirit and be God-searched. All right? Who can choose his lapses and his errors? Who can discern his lapses and his errors? Who can figure himself out? Who thinks they're so smart that they know they can, they can figure themselves out? God knit you together in your mother's womb, and he's the only one smart enough to untie the knots. For you to think that you know something, you be, you, you, in that wisdom, you actually sabotage yourself. It says, who can discern his lapses? Clear me from hidden and unconscious faults. Unconscious faults, well, then I can't figure them out. I'm going to have to rely on God to search me. Oh, man, just when I was about ready to do it by myself, I thought I had a pretty good handle on who I am. No, that's from your perspective. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, never ask the thing. Ask the creator of the thing. Oh, he has a different perspective on you than you have on yourself. Now, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins so that you might not have domination over me, that I might be blameless, that I'll be innocent of great transgression. You know, I want the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. I don't want, I want to deal with the little stuff so the big stuff doesn't trip me up. No. To put on, and this part everyone's heard, you put off the old man. And you need to understand how that works. And to, to tweak the drop down area, really what you need more than anything <laughs> is really understanding uh, the five functions. We have material on this stuff. But when you're listening to a sermon, most people go to their head. You should be go to your head and open your heart while you're on it because what you'll catch is the nature, the divine nature and the anointing that is on the words. You need that more than you need words. Faith doesn't come by reading your Bible. Faith comes by that relationship with him. It's the God kind of faith. Faith comes by hearing, touching, seeing, if the, if the nature of God is on it. The devil could quote scripture. You're not going to get much edification out of that. Right? So understanding that this, this term drop down refers to focus or awareness. And we said if you're going to tweak area one, area two needs to be tweaked as well. And area two, if you're going to really tweak the drop-down concept, you need to know how to be open, receive forgiveness, give forgiveness, and then identify peace, off, O-F-F. -F. And you, it needs to be practiced in day-to-day -day activities. And if God's going to direct your past, the, there's an emphasis here that, that we've kind of taken lightly, and we've mentioned it previously. It's in... The concept of forgiving God, self, and others, we've gotten a little lax on forgiving God. You said, God, what did he do? He didn't do nothing wrong. No, he didn't. But you get mad at circumstances. I'm trying to say that what needs tweaked in the body of Christ right now is to learn how to navigate in those circumstances by being attached to God in the spirit. If you're just upset with circumstances and that's all you do is complain about it, you're judging God. You're judging God. You're judging God. You're judging God. Is there, is this, is this CD is stuck. You're judging God. You're judging. <laughs> 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 
remove the judgment against God with those circumstances because what God's trying to do is say, in this world there'll be tribulation, but be of good cheer. I'm going to try to direct your path. Let me direct your path. Find out what I have for you to do in the midst of. He is actually smart enough to get you out of any mess. He's smarter than everything the devil can throw at you circumstantially. He's smarter than that. And if you were smart, you would lean on him and not your own understanding, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he would direct your path. Then you could say, consider it pure joy when you suffer trials. The testing of your faith produces patience. What is patience? Patience is holding the heart open, going, oh, God, what a mess is going on. Everything's falling apart. I, wanna, I wonder how you're going to work this one out, God. What do you want me to do? If you took that approach, you would never, never, never be disappointed. Hope does not disappoint, but hope requires you to be open to God. Once you complain, you shut the door. There's got to be a death. You want to tweak the 60-day challenge? There's got to be a death to your complaining. It, they died in the wilderness with complaining, and by golly, they should have been ashamed of themselves. They were, there was not a weak or feeble one among them. They didn't have anything to complain about. They were being fed, but they didn't like it. Well, you know what? Your life isn't about your preference. Your life is about your performance. And God's looking for someone to perform as sons and daughters of God. But area two is learning the fivefold function of your spirit. And that is learning to receive. You receive here, not here. You receive here. You forgive from here or your forgiveness doesn't work. If you don't forgive from the heart, right? And the forgiveness should be a lifestyle. And no more in this church, if you're going to tweak it for the next 60 days, I want to hear about how you drop down. You learn to stay down. That's the divine focus. Pray about something, yeah. But how do you do that? From the heart. Loving intercession. The way you really learn what loving intercession is, I'm really praying, preaching, teaching, living, is that after the, when there's no barrier to anything, what's flowing out of you is love. So even after you forgive somebody, say there's a wall and somebody hurt your feelings. You feel the hurt, you let forgiveness flow, the hurt goes away. What's left? A flow. That's a pure heart. A pure heart's going to see God. Okay? Now, <clears throat> those five functions, loving, I mean receiving, forgiving, loving, and then what have we seen on Thursday night a great deal of? Releasing demands and expectations. You are not God. But you play God when you have demands and expectations on everybody else. What you think they should do how you think they should behave towards you. Well, king self. <laughs> that's, what it's, that's, that's who's on the throne. That's not Jesus. All right? <laughs> and, and prayer would be area three. Remember, area two, stay down. <laughs> Don't tell me about dropping down. Stay down. Area three, the prayer connection. Oh, boy, you want to tweak your 60-day challenge, pay attention. Anoint my ear to hear what he's about to say now, because this is key. We already know that there is a competition, even in dealing with yourself, and others, to move from God-focused to self-focused. That's got to die. God-searched, not self-searched. Only arrogance insists on self-focused, self-searched, self-protected. You know, I, I don't think there was a place we went to where the majority of the church didn't protect themselves from people and circumstances. Huh? If you wanted to see heads nod in any given church, any church we went to, we would just say, when you see somebody you don't like 
or someone that you would rather avoid, but here they are walking down the aisle in the grocery store and you cannot escape. And you're forcing a confrontation with someone that you would just love to avoid. The first thing you do in your spirit, in your gut, is you put up a wall. That's self-protection. There's no God in that. You are playing God. You are saying, I'm going to protect me. If I don't protect me, who will? Well, God would, but you're not. You just cut them off. You just, you're, you're into protecting yourself. If you want to you wanna tweak the, the area three, the prayer connection, understand this. You want to be God-focused, God-searched, God-protected, and God-ruled. Because there's the flesh will do the same thing. Self-focused, self-search, self-protected, self-ruled. That independent self wants to be king self. So there's king self or king Jesus, you choose. King Jesus, it's his it's focus on him. It's allowing him to search. It's allowing his peace to guard your heart and your mind. He can guard you better than you can guard yourself. That self-protection is flesh. You're not walking in the spirit when you're busy protecting yourself and God rule. But here's the here's the, the key. God ruled means peace is ruling. But here's to tweak area three. Here's the weakness that I've seen. And that is uh, whenever I've run into someone that's kind of gone off the deep end, all inner knowings are seeing, hearing, and touching in the spirit. Everybody that's gone off the deep end tells me about what they saw and what they heard. I heard voices. Well, voices told me it was God. Voices told me to do this. Voices. You know what the weakness is in that? And I don't ever want to see it in our church. I want to see you pro be proficient in the 60-day challenge. It isn't about what you see or hear as much as it's about who you're attached to. Prayer is not talking and saying and decreeing and declaring alone. Prayer is being with someone. If you're not with him, I don't really care what you see or hear. I only want to pay attention to who's with him who is the source of those words and what they see and hear? We have it backwards. I, I deal with people all the time. I see this and I hear this and God said this and God said that. And what's coming from them is not the love of God. It's not the nature of God. It, you know what it is? Self-interest. I want what I want. And that's got to be God because God wants to make me happy. No, that's called preference. Everybody has preferences, but that's not God. You want to tweak this area three, learn how to get neutral. Learn to check yourself out that you're neutral. Um, the best biblical scholars always said that he and his wife, uh, uh, Bill Morford, he said, my wife's a little more discerning than I am, but he says, what we've agreed to is green light, red light, yellow light. That's beautiful for a married couple. That's beautiful for a single person. Red light, green light, yellow light. Green is you've got the inner okay from God. Your conscience bears witness with your spirit. As a child of God, you're a partaker of the divine nature. If they're married and one's got a green light, one's got a red light, what does that mean? It means somebody's wrong. I ain't pointing fingers here, but in a marriage, one's got a green light, one's got a red light. Somebody's wrong. Somebody's not hearing from God. In a marriage, you need two green lights, two red lights, two yellow lights. And if one of them is contrary to what is the known will of God, then I disobey them. I'm talking Mary. I'm not going to sin because my wife or my husband wants to go a godless way. That's their business, and they'll stand, but I'm going to follow God. That's for me and my We're going to serve the Lord. So now I just warned Jennifer that if she <laughs> ever tries to get me to do something horrible, I'm not going to do it. If it's sin, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to listen to you. I love you, but I'm not going to listen to you. 
And you know what she'll do? She'll say, I'm sorry, honey. And then we'll both have green lights and do it my way. <laughs> we'll do it God's way. That's right, not my way. We, my way or the highway, that's, that's, a, that's King's self. Yeah. All right, so area three is learning that prayer, the prayer connection is God focused, God searched, God protected, God ruled, simple prayer. But the key element in our prayer time, listen to this. When I disciple Jennifer, before you learn how to deal with your issues, we enjoy God. The majority of the time in prayer is enjoying God. It would be like a Tuesday night here. The majority of your relationship should be enjoying God, not finding out what's wrong with you. You don't jump right to that. And what we did was in finding out uh, in our prayer time, we spend most of our time touching, not seeing and hearing. We could touch them for days without really getting any, any standout perception. Days. But all these people are seeing here, seeing here, seeing here, seeing here. If you're not walking the walk, I'm not impressed. It's just words. It's like Pygmalion said, my fair lady. Remember the Henry Higgins, her professor was trying to teach her how to talk, and she just went, words, 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 words. If you love me, show me. That's what we're saying. If you really love God, show him by your behavior, not by your words, words, words. Anybody can say the right answers. The devil could quote scripture. The key for area three to really tweak it, though, is to spend more time presencing him. By the way, you know, a walk in the spirit is meant to be a constant. Abiding is meant to be a constant perception, feeling. Yeah, feeling. Awareness, awareness, awareness. So I am not impressed with everyone who I hear, I see, I hear, I see, unless what's attached to that is that divine acknowledgement. Divine, intimate connection. If you don't have a divine, intimate connection, I've never seen, have you seen anybody go off the deep end going, I'm just too wrapped up loving God. I've been loving God for hours on and that will pay. Oh, did you ever have to send them for, for uh, to institutionalize them? I've never seen it. I've never seen anybody who drew so close to God intimately that they had to be institutionalized. But I've seen people institutionalized Christians for seeing and hearing, seeing and hearing, seeing and hearing. Voices. I got voices. Yeah. You better get your intimacy together before you worry about I see, I hear, I see, I hear. Those are valid because they're inner knowings. But I'm saying there's three levels of feeling. There's physiological feeling, there's emotional feeling, and there's spiritual feeling. And unless you're in the spiritual realm of intimacy with God, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, touch to, I don't trust most people's discernment with seeing and hearing. And a lot of times they'll tell me what they see and they hear, and I will feel what's attached to it is not clean. <laughs> Maybe we ought to take a step back and tweak all this as a church. What do you think? These are for my men, and my men are the best around. I'm sorry. Am I apologizing for that? They're the best around. These are sons and daughters. But this is a season that God's saying, now's the time to tweak it. Now's the time to not think that you've arrived and got a handle on it. All right? Area three. Feeling intimacy with God far outweighs seeing and hearing. Far outweighs seeing and hearing. Because one can be a constant. Seeing and hearing is not a constant. Nobody walks around going, oh, God showed me this, and God showed me that, and God showed me this, and I see this, and I heard this, and I heard that, and I heard this. All day long, it is not a constant. But presencing him can be. Practicing his presence can be a constant. All right, area number five. If you are going to really tweak, well, four, did I skip four? <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, I was in a hurry. You know what I say? All right. Area three, the prayer connection. Area four is understanding the two kingdoms. This is uh, this is relatively easy, but if you would call yourself on it, this is something that you call yourself on. 
that we were delivered from the power of darkness when you got born again. You were conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of His love. The kingdom of God is. Do you believe that you walk in the kingdom? Do you believe as a Christian you're a kingdom person? The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. All three are emotional. Righteousness is love and action. The kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. How much kingdom are you living in? Are you just a religious person who got saved? Love, joy, peace is the essence of the nature of God and the kingdom. Are you, is he king or is he your savior? You know, you can, you can tread a lot of water as a Christian and say, I got fire insurance, now I ask Jesus to come into my heart, and now I just tread water. I pretty much do whatever I want to do because I've got insurance. That's not kingdom. That's, he may be your savior, but he's not Lord. So area four is actually quite simple. And that is, you know what the fruit of the Spirit are, love, joy, peace, basically, patience, kindness, goodness, all of those things that under pressure it's supposed to produce even greater amounts in you as you hold the heart open to God. Hope doesn't disappoint. Hope is open. Love's going to come through, and he wants to guide you in the midst of that. And it's never as fast as we want it. That's the temptation the enemy uses. Matter of fact, he'll come to you and say, oh, you can get your healing now. Oh, yeah, actually, it's worse. Ah, ah. That, does that sound like God guiding and directing you in the midst of it? No, no. That's the enemy tormenting. The kingdom of fear is the enemy's kingdom, and that is area four. Love is God's kingdom, and you are brought into that kingdom out of the kingdom of fear, what we call the hell flags, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, chain. So you really want to tweak area four in the days ahead? This is your bottom line for area four. See how fast when you feel hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, chain, even if it's just a temptation you didn't sin, see how fast you can get back to releasing it. And the simple thing to do on area four is connect own, express. And make, now here's some competition that's not bad. You're competing against the devil. <laughs> he works from the outside to torment you with trials and tribulations. He's working from the outside to get you to make a connection with him, agree with him, because then he owns you, and then he can express himself through you. But he's working from the outside. If we could stay dropped down, and then you feel like you missed it, oh, I received forgiveness. I'm back in the other kingdom. I got peace. Connect. God is trying to connect with you, and he's working from the inside. He's closer. Why are you listening to these voices and feelings that are coming from out here when he's right here going, come on, Dennis. Let's draw nigh to me. I'll draw nigh to you. Connect, own, and express for area four. And see how fast you can do that. In other words, something get your goat. Go, uh, uh. I receive forgiveness even when it's just temptation sometimes, just to, just to, just to make an acknowledgement. You're not, you're not going there. And release it. And you're back in the kingdom where you belong in peace. Area five the most important area, but I'm going to sum up the simplest. In the 60-day challenge, if you really want to optimize it, I watch people do this all the time. They deal with the day-to-day -day stuff, and yes, that works. They deal with the day-to-day -day stuff because stuff's happening at home, in the family, at work. That is the slower work. It does work, but that's the slower way. And if you see a cycle of, oh, there's that same old, same old again, instead of just dealing with it and asking for forgiveness and then having to deal with it again a week later or two weeks later, something similar, why not say, go for the root. God, when did that get started in my life? Doesn't that make more sense to do it that way? Where did that get started? You, both will work. You can ask for forgiveness. You could have a boss at work that you've got to forgive every day. 
Or you can say, God, where'd that get started? I think I have an authority issue. <laughs> and don't even go there, because that's analysis. Now, where'd that get started? It's Dennis said it's cycles of repetitive behavior. Well, I'd like to kill him every day when I go to work. <laughs> I, clearly see a, I clearly see a cycle. Or how about this one, an overreaction? How about after a while, your boss says, uh, could you just leave that notebook on my desk? Leave it on your desk! I've been leaving it on your desk all week! Do you think that might be a little bit of an overreaction for leaving the notebook on my desk? Those are all signs of a root issue, not just, I'm sorry for my behavior. You want to, you want to clearly optimize that 60-day challenge, then start dealing with roots. And even pet peeves, if you've got a pet peeve, guess what? There's a root to it. I'd say, God, when this gets started, then at least minimize its impact on you. If you lose it because of a pet peeve, which usually doesn't involve you anyway, it's somebody else, get out of that jurisdiction. That's not your, any of your business. You've got the goat. Deal with your goat. We've got to kill that goat. <laughs> or cast them out, one or the other two. All right? So if, if that's a root is a personality structure that functions like a pipeline or a conduit. There's a flow. A repetitive flow. All it takes is a little bit of stimulation and out it pops. Therefore, just like a, a tree has roots, and where is it? Planted in the ground, right? And it's hidden from view. It's buried in the ground. The most important function of roots is getting water and nutrients for the tree or plant. They draw up water and nutrients from the soil in which they're planted. Spiritual roots draw either life or death. Spiritual roots are either drawing life or death. Got roots? <laughs> Ask the Holy Spirit, where did that get started? You would, you would really, really successfully optimize the 60-day challenge if you wouldn't just deal with your owies, but that you would say, where did that get started? Because here's the key, and this is something uh, that I, I learned from Jennifer, and that was uh, childhood roots. Judgments are formed. Like if you picture an adult, and she, well, yeah, a picture of this in one of the modules. The entry point, roots are simple. The entry point could happen in childhood, zero to six. And by six to 12, your personality is pretty well intact. But these roots will have an effect, and fruit can be complicated. The same root of rejection could lead one person to grow up promiscuous, the other person could grow up a hell's angel, the other person could grow up and be uh, a Rhodes Scholar that God is education. I, a root will produce complicated fruit. But the root is simple. And if you want to see transformation that's for the better, you say, God, where did that get started? And if you really, really, really want to see the 60-day challenge become better, not only ask for roots, but go back to old stuff. The key for Jennifer's rapid 60-day challenge was she did childhood stuff. Get rid of the childhood baggage early. Don't wait and let it manifest in your marriage and then deal with it every day like, gee, that woman's just like my mother. Well, that, that man, he's just like my father. Well, maybe if you would have dealt with all of that stuff a whole lot earlier, you'd have been better off. Ages 6 to 12, 0 to 6 is your root system where you made judgments. And just because you don't remember those judgments, they don't die. They're buried alive, and they will pop up and manifest in some complicated way. Simple roots, complicated fruit. Whatever is suppressed will be expressed. So again, 
I just can't wait to see a challenge going forth to the people to optimize their spiritual life and prepare and make ready a people prepare for the days ahead. So in this area six, we need to understand area five that was bitter roots. Area six is recognizing, and this kind of flows over from the bitter roots, uh, the laws of God operate in the natural and the spiritual. These laws operate. And bitter roots are going to be how you see God. Do you see why it's so important to deal with the basic laws of relationship? And actually, if you go back, you will handle this area six. will get better. And that is sowing and reaping. Don't get into the head and think you're figuring something out. Be not deceived. What you sow, you reap. Reaping more than we have sown, it's a harvest. It's not just going to be a little thing. Oh, that's just a little thing. That little thing is a seed. If it's good, fine. If it's bad, it's going to reap a harvest. Honoring and dishonoring parents. Honor your mother and father. That your days may be long and that things will go well with you. To the degree you won't honor them, things do not go well with you. And honor, we've said it again and again, it's not about honoring their bad behavior, but it's about you forgiving and getting whatever behavior you wanted or didn't want, get it from God. It's not that hard. Why haven't you gotten it from God? Why are you still demanding it from parents, or husbands, or wives, or friends? Why are you demanding anything when in reality, God is more than willing to give that to you? You have to make space by releasing demands and expectations. We saw that on Thursdays, almost every Thursday the tremendous amount of demands and expectations placed on other people. They are not your source. Now, honoring and judging. You who judge, you're going to do the same thing. You will do what you've done with others, and also you will receive from that judgment the same thing. So, understanding that. But the main thing is, is that all of these laws of relationship are affected by bitter roots. So area six is just knowing the laws of relationship and going to deal. If you, again, if you would deal with old stuff, you'd handle that one. Deal with old baggage. Married couples, you brought your suitcase into the marriage. Deal with your suitcase, stay out of his. He needs to stay out of hers. He needs to deal with his suitcase. All right? And the last area... This is the real challenge. But I wouldn't give it to uh, uh, novices. And that would be the peace challenge. Did you keep your peace all day long? People and circumstances. Did you sin or was it just a temptation? <laughs> Did you have peace before you made a business decision? So don't complain when it doesn't work out. Were you a positive influence at work or a negative influence? <coughs> Did peace guard your heart and trample the enemy under your feet today? Did you walk in victory of peace? Where there's no walls, no stress, no negative emotions, you responded and not reacted. There's the challenge for area seven. I've learned to respond to people and circumstances, not react. And did you practice today? The end. <laughs> Father, seal his work by the power of the Holy Spirit. Challenge all of us to move in these seven areas with a more implicit trust in God, and getting to the point to where we are optimizing, optimizing our wisdom and insight that comes from you, God, in the days ahead. We're going to be a people prepared for what's coming down the pike. And we're going to be strong in the Lord and more than victorious, more than conquerors through him. And none of those scriptures that talk about pressure and troubles and tribulation, none of those 
put fear in us, they all say, my God is able. I've removed this ability to harm you. In this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, or I've removed this ability to harm you. We're going to be a people that are going to go into that realm where he's removed this ability to harm us. If it's harming us, we let it somehow. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.